Hello, I'm speaking with Helio Fred Garcia, founder and president of the Logos Consulting Group and author of the new book, The Power of Communication, Skills to Build Trust, Inspire Loyalty, and Lead Effectively. Mr. Garcia, what does war fighting have to do with communication? You know, in 2005, I was doing some guest speaking at the United States Marine Corps Command and Staff College in Quantico, Virginia. And I happened upon a slim book called War Fighting, Doctrinal Publication Number 1, by the United States Marine Corps. And as I flipped through the book in the Marine Corps bookstore, I noticed something very intriguing. The book wasn't about fighting wars. It was really about how to think about war, how to think about one's role in war, how to think about one's goals in war, and how to think about how to organize resources and activity in order to accomplish your purpose in war. I also found that by simply changing a couple of words, I could create a very powerful conceptual framework on how to be an effective communicator. So for example, the first paragraph of war fighting says of war that war is fundamentally an interactive social process, a process of continuous mutual adaptation, of give and take, of move and counter move. Well, when you think about it, effective communication is just that. Effective communication is a process of continuous mutual adaptation, of give and take, of move and counter move. It isn't about sending messages out into the world and hoping they hit. It's about actually connecting with human beings, seeing the response, connecting again, seeing the response, and that continuous loop of engagement and feedback in both directions is what leads to powerful communication. So you say that that is effective communication. What's the difference between effective communication and ineffective communication? You know, the most recent chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff until he retired earlier this year was Admiral Mike Mullen. And Admiral Mullen published a piece in the scholarly journal of the United States military called Taking Strategic Communication Seriously. And Admiral Mullen said in his article in 2009 that much of what passes for strategic communication isn't strategic at all and actually isn't effective communication. He said in his piece, we've come to think of messages the way we think of rockets, as something we can launch downrange in the hope that they hit something. But he says, effective communication isn't about telling our story, it isn't about sending our message, but it's about connecting with human beings. It's as much about listening as it is about speaking. The way he puts it is, we, if we are to win hearts and minds, we have to listen to each heart and each mind, and we need to win one heart, one mind at a time. Effective communication is the process of engaging in ways that move an audience to think and feel and know and do something differently, and that you intended them to think and feel and know and do. Ineffective communication doesn't. So if this is the Marine Corps' framework in terms of strategy, do they also apply this to communication? There are examples where they use these strategic principles when they've had to communicate? The Marines actually have done a remarkable job of protecting their reputation during difficult times. We've seen instances of misbehavior in war zones that have been treated with immediate engagement by the Marines with stakeholders so that incidents that had the potential to be defining embarrassments, perhaps even defining atrocities, were dealt with in a timely and effective and honorable way. And so what could have been multi-news cycle stories were contained in a single news cycle because the Marines were seen to have done what a responsible organization would do. So yes, the Marines do embed their own principles into their own communication. More significantly, though, is the practical application for civilian leaders on how to be engaged and engaging in ways that help us accomplish real business goals. You know, another translation from the art of war to the art of leadership in civilian life is to do the same kind of maneuver, change a single word, from the work of Karl von Clausewitz the 19th century Prussian military strategist and the author of On War, one of the most influential books in Western civilization. 
Clausewitz defined war as the continuation of policy by other means. I define effective communication as the continuation of business by other means. Clausewitz said that war is an act of will directed toward a living entity that reacts. And I define effective communication as an act of will directed toward a living entity that reacts. Now let's unbundle that definition. Effective communication is an act of will. It's always done on purpose. It's always done for a purpose. It's never done incidentally, and it's never done off the top of one's head. Effective communication is never about what makes the speaker feel good, but it's always about accomplishing some specific goal by changing something about our audiences. It's an act of will directed toward a living entity. Audiences aren't passive entities to be acted upon. They're living, breathing human beings and groups of human beings who have their own needs, their own desires, their own capacities, and frankly, their own levels of desire even to be in relationship with us. It's an act of will directed towards a living entity that reacts. The only reason to engage an audience is to change something, to change the way they think and feel, to change what they know and do, an effective communicator always begin by, begins by asking, who is the group that matters to us? What do we want that group to think and feel and know and do? How do we engage them so that they think and feel and know and do that? And then the effective communicator does that, changes the audience in meaningful ways. By focusing on the warfighting strategic discipline and applying it to civilian communication, we can actually be much more efficient as well as much more effective in winning hearts and minds. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. In your book, you include several case studies of effective and ineffective communication. And your first one is Tony Hayward from BP. Isn't that an instance where he could have been more strategic? Well, let's, let's talk about what happened uh, in 2010 in the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. For the longest time, public criticism was on BP for seeming to have been unprepared for the calamity that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. After weeks of all BP doesn't know what it's doing all the time, Mr. Hayward began to communicate in ways that suggested that he was feeling sorry for himself. So in an internal meeting, he said, speaking of the criticism of the company, what the hell did we do to deserve this? Now that happened to have been recorded. That recording was leaked. It became viral on the internet and soon made it into mainstream media. And it was all Tony Hayward is feeling sorry for himself all the time. Mr. Hayward decided to correct that by holding a press conference. And in the press conference, he wanted to apologize. And he wanted to say that he took the situation seriously. And it began well enough. He began by saying, we're sorry. We're sorry for the massive disruption that this has caused to people's lives. But then he said something else. He said, you know, there's no one who wants this over more than I do. You know, I'd like my life back. And when he said, I'd like my life back, everything that preceded that sentence stopped mattering. Because I'd like my life back came across as self-pity, came across as caring only for himself. And the worst part was the metaphor of my life back ran smack into the reality that 11 people would never get their lives back. They had been killed in the explosion. Many people would be injured and harmed for life because of the explosion, and thousands of people would see their livelihood disrupted because of the gushing of oil into the Persian Gulf. That single statement, I'd like my life back, began the inexorable decline of Tony Hayward so that several months later, he was out of a job. He had lost the trust and confidence of the people who mattered to him of the Coast Guard, of the Congress, of his own board of directors, and ultimately he had to be cast out for BP to continue to keep public support in other ways. Thank you. One last question. Uh, the, the kind of third section of your book near the end, it deviates away from war fighting and instead talks about the literal practical application of effective communication. It's about 
how you present yourself physically and you speak of neuroscience and metaphor. Can you just speak a little bit about why that's included in the book? Well, it's included because one of the core principles of warfighting is first that every Marine is required to be professional and capable in the use of arms and in combat tactics. Now that doesn't necessarily apply to other branches of the armed forces. If you're a lawyer in the Marine Corps, you're still expected to be able to fire a weapon and to engage in close order combat. If you simply translate that principle, I translate it as every leader has a responsibility to be professional and capable in the persuasive art. Just as every Marine needs to be proficient in the use of firearms, every leader needs to be proficient in the use of communication as a leadership tool. So the back end of the book is ways that individual leaders can take seriously the need to build into their own personal professional development plan ways to continuously improve their communication capacity. One of the things I point out in the book is that many leaders find that the skills that get them to the top are typically quantitative in nature but the skills that are necessary to stay at the top and to win hearts and minds at the top include things that aren't necessarily quantitative, including interpersonal engagement, the ability to inspire trust and confidence. The more leaders understand how to win trust and confidence, both conceptually and physically and interpersonally, the more likely they are to succeed in winning trust and confidence. Thank you, Mr. Garcia.